Hey guys. How's it Hi, going? How are you? Hey, good. How are you? Good. Doing pretty good. Thanks for uh, coming on. Doing yeah. that. It's so funny for me how people have just latched onto this movie. Yeah. What what was um both yours and Toby's reaction to the movie when it initially was released? I mean, we, we both liked it. The, the the thing is there were there were some edits that were made that we weren't happy about that really altered the entire movie. Most people think the director's cut was those edits put back in, and it's actually just tiny snippets of gore that had to be taken out. Um, okay. The actual cut I'm talking about had this Timex watch sequence, which I talk about in the, in the commentary on the Blu-ray. This scene that just set up the comedy early on, and then people would get the humor. Now people seem to get the humor without uh-huh. that, but then they didn't. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny you say that because uh, like Matt's watched the movie a lot before, but I actually watched it for the first time last night. Um, you know, it's so funny. Like, I like how you said that um, you use like the word comedy because, you know, I was going back and forth the whole time. Like, is this a comedy? Is it a horror movie? And, you know, well, it's, it's, it's funny because the um, I think it's like it's probably the darkest comedy I've ever seen, but I would call it a comedy. Well, think- it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Toby and I both had very sick, dark senses of humor. Toby, <laughs> darker than mine. I mean, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, after I met Toby, and I went back and I watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre, when Grandpa has the hammer and he's trying to hit yeah. it, Sally, and he keeps dropping the hammer, and I'm going, oh, that is, that's Toby. I mean, that's funny, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Once you're done, like, like screaming, you can understand that it, it is really fun. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I mean, not comedy in the sense of a screwball comedy, right? But it's yeah. intended to be dark humor, to make it entertaining. I mean, you have to do something with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, adding on to that, too, uh, you know, just, like, with the way that Toby directed it on set, I'm curious, like, how he kind of managed that mood on set, because it's such a distinct style and a distinct mood and, like, a distinct form of comedy that the movie... Yeah kind of achieved so i'm curious like how was toby able to get all these actors and actresses to kind of like understand his vision and like what he wanted to do with it a lot of it is they got it from the script i mean a lot of what you're talking about also is done in prep it's done in the design of the laundry it's uh-huh. done in the costume you kind of if you're on that set i mean that mangler was built for real that was a an empty warehouse in South Africa and all that art direction, what was on the walls, the lamps, the steam, all that was built, designed intentionally. And it was so overly oppressive that the actors couldn't help but be immersed in that room because it wasn't like a set where you fly out the walls. It's just two walls. It was completely immersive. You were in that. And when the mangler was running, it was loud and there's steam blasting. And it, it was in that design. I think the actors got what they were doing and the humor then would come from the adjustments as they were going and they didn't know they were trying to be funny because you don't want an actor to try to be funny you want them to play it straight and let the situation be funny but toby had a way of guiding them to it got you but that's really interesting like i never considered a director you know kind of like understanding that this is supposed to be funny and like not necessarily like letting the actors know that and just kind of letting them play it straight. Like that's oh, a really interesting. Approach. Oh, that's a, that's a crucial thing. The worst yeah. thing you can do to an actor is say, be funny. The only person in the world who can do that is Jim Carrey. I mean, look at a movie. It's an old movie, but look at airplane. Nobody yeah. is playing that as a comedy. They're playing it like a drama because uh-huh. if they tried to be funny, it wouldn't be funny. The actors have to play the truth of the character. And if the situation then in that truth brings out the humor, then it works. I mean, the, yeah. you know, the, the, it, it's really the tone Toby set. Yeah, mm. like, that's a really good point with Airplane too, because like if you compare like a parody movie like Airplane to let's say like a parody movie that came out in the 2000s, like Scary mm. Movie or something. Right. You see all the actors in Scary Movie, you know, they're hammy. They're kind of like right. hammy about the right. humor. And in airplane, it's much more like they're playing it straight, and like that's why it's funnier. Exactly. 
yeah, that's that's why it's funnier than scary movie. They were all hamming it up because it really doesn't work. I don't think. Yeah. Really good points, yeah. Yeah, there's moments where like of the scene where Mrs. Frowley falls into the mangler, mangler yeah. chasing after <laughs> antacids, right. uh, which, which I really like. I relate to that scene from the level of just being a worker because there's been so many moments like mm. where I'm working. I got all these stressful things going on at once. And then the manager behind me yells at me about something. Right. And like, right. I'm like, but the tone in that scene is realistic, relatable. And yeah. also when she goes into the manga, it's very horrific. In right. But video, it's also, yeah, yeah. but it's also Toby that the genius of extending the moments. I learned a lot from him about this. Like she, she reaches, right. She's doing this. She's Oh God. And you're and the audience go, no, don't. Oh God, don't. And then, yeah. You know, stretches out that moment, which is what makes it all the more horrific when you know she's going to get caught. But it's so much better than her just walking up going, oh, woo, and she's stuck in the machine. It's those. Yeah. And that's like, a lot of. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of what Toby did is he, you know, that moment's not in the script that it's stretched out like that. That's directing. Mm -hmm. That's interpreting the script. Mm -hmm. That's really what made it work. That setup. Gotcha. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, did, um, did Stephen King ever, like, communicate with Toby about the movie? Well, during the writing, we would write, I, I would write pages. Toby would fax it to Stephen's agent at CAA. I think it was Rand Holston, who was his agent until, I think, Rand died like a year ago. Um, Stephen King was in a, his cabin in Maine writing a novel. I don't know which one because he writes 20 novels a year. Yeah. But apparently in that cabin, he had a fax machine. That was it. And only his agent had the number. And oh. we would fax pages to the agent. The agent would fax them to Stephen King. He would fax them back to the agent and fax them to us. So we get these smudgy faxes with Stephen King's notes on them. And I was like, oh, man, I would now I wish I had saved them. So he was very much involved in the development of the script because he had script approval. First huh. time he had that's actually how this whole thing came about. Do you know how the Mangler came about? Matt, do you know? The Lawnmower Man. Yeah, Somehow. it's yes. The same producers who made Lawnmower Man or the executive producers had the rights to the Mangler. Mm -hmm. And Stephen King was so upset that Lawnmower Man deviated so far from his story. I don't know if you remember, I think he sued them because they yeah. had to they, they actually wanted to sell it as Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man. He goes, no, this is not mine. So he he essentially told those producers, I'm not going to let you make The Mangler. I, I will okay. stop you. And they sold the rights to Harry Allen Towers, who then contacted Annette Singh. And that's how it came about. The caveat was Stephen King had script approval. Okay. Yeah. When I auditioned for the part of the screenwriter, I had to pitch Toby. And then he had to call Stephen King and they... Then they paid me fifteen hundred dollars and told me to write a draft in ten days. Not, oh, wow. I, what I didn't know that there were, had been many other screenwriters who took a shot at this, and he didn't approve the scripts. So that, that was an audition. I didn't know it. So I wrote a draft in ten days. Almost killed me. Stephen King thought it was great, and then we started for real. Huh. So he, he he was totally involved in the writing of the script, and not during the shooting because he didn't see dailies because we were in South Africa and it was all film. So we weren't shipping film anywhere. Um, but Toby did go to Portland, Maine to screen the movie for him. And this is what Toby described. Uh, it was very funny is because it, Stephen King wrote the story so long ago that he didn't remember what were his details and what weren't, but the greatest compliment was he would say like a moment he would go, was that me? And Toby go, ah, no, no, man, that was us. Oh, damn. Okay. No, was that me? No, man, that was us. Damn. Okay. So he, you know, it, my goal always was, I think the reason these other screenwriters didn't get the job is they tried to make it something else. I just tried to make it Stephen King, just make yeah. it more of it. Yeah. Pretty simple formula, but you know, a lot of people don't do that. The screening went really well, that screening. So yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring up a uh, lawnmower man too, because I can see why, like after lawnmower man was like rejected so heavily, why he would be scared of the mangler specifically, because they're both like very simple stories. You know, yeah. it's not like you're you're directing like it or Salem's Lot, where it's like a very plot intricate story. Right. They're both stories where it's like it's an idea and you kind of roll with it. Right. And because of that, you know, like screenwriters or directors, they have to throw more stuff into it. 
So right. I can see why he'd be like apprehensive. Like they did this to the lawnmower man. Like, uh, right. They'll probably do it to the mangler because it's the same kind of story, you know? And it wasn't, the short story was not cinematic. It's a horror movie with a monster that's bolted to the ground. That's a fundamental problem. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, a horror movie rests on the ability of the monster to be monstrous. I mean, you know, the example I always use is Freddy Krueger attacks you in your dreams. Everyone has to fall asleep at some point. You know, it's the perfect horror monster. So we had a machine bolted to the ground. What do you do with that? Yeah. Yeah, that's so true, too, because, like, I mean, up until then, like, the only real comparison to a similar kind of monster might be, like, Christine or something, the car, but at least Christine could, like, move around. Right, you know? exactly. A, like, it's a, a monster that's not going anywhere. Like, right. That's, it's true. Like, it's very interesting. Yeah. And that's also <laughs> why, you know, it was decided to go with the dark humor to make it entertaining. And you also, in addition to the humor, which is great, you add like a lot of subtext and a lot of direct existential fear. Like there's a moment where JJJ Picture Man vomits blood at the camera and there's nothing like supernatural about it, but it's very disturbing and unsettling. And that's all just, it's in the same vein of horror, but it's a different kind of horror. Yeah, actually, I tried to get Jeremy, who played Picture Man, to join us, but he's in Cape Town at the moment. Um, oh, wow. so, the, the t- so it would have been like four in the morning for him. He lives in yeah. he lives in the U.S. now, but he he went back for a little while. Gotcha. Oh, wow. He's actually really going to be guy. on Bro- he's actually going to be on Broadway in a Martin McDonough play called Hangman. Oh nice. yeah, got gotcha. you. Heard of that? Yeah, because he he wrote um he wrote three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yeah, right? that guy. Yeah, 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 yes. Um, so I read the short story after seeing the film. And uh, I noticed some of the best scenes in the, obviously it's a, it's a short story, but some of the best scenes, even some of the best characters aren't even in the short story, like Gartley. He's like mentioned. Right. Or JJJ Picture Man, which I think. Well, is he's not guy. even, he, he's not even, that was a total Toby invention. I thought so. Yeah. 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 Only yeah. Toby would think of a hundred year old photographer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like the grandpa yeah. in Chainsaw. But, yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. That's yeah, exactly. Right. It's a very like weird, like distinct, like Toby Hooper character. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like the the yuppies in the beginning of like Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. Like, you know, just weird characters like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, he originally was- originally we were gonna we tried to cast actually an older actor in, in South Africa. We couldn't find anyone. And Toby paraded Jeremy in. And Jerry was probably Jeremy was probably 35 at the time. Mm-hmm. And Toby goes, What do you think, man? Picture man. I go, I think he's gonna need some makeup. <laughs> <laughs> it works because like hooper's style to an extent was like having one foot firmly in reality and another foot in like a slightly hyper stylized reality where it's uncanny right right yeah. and then we do the the one inside joke where picture man is down in the morgue and he walks out and the mortician walks in and the mortician is jeremy without makeup right which is really fitting because both those characters share this uh, element of their job to where it's their job to like record or be around like bodies. and Right. Exactly. Yep. Right. Yeah. No, we had to add characters. I mean, Gartley was the obvious bad guy, mm-hmm. the, the human opponent. Right. Um, and that whole scene, the conversation between um, Hunton and Gartley is amazing. Like, uh, in, Gar- in Gartley's yeah. office. And that scene, I could tell you, that scene was actually shot in two parts. We had Robert, in order to afford Robert, what you did back then, I don't know if it's still the case, is people would pay him quite a bit of money for two weeks. So he would, he came for two weeks. So we shot any, all this, that scene, I'm trying to remember what order we shot it in. I'm pretty sure we shot any shot where Ted and Robert are in the same shot or Robert's in a single, mm-hmm. we shot there. But we shot all of Robert's scenes back to back. Then we went back into the office and Ted's close up and any shot where Gartley was not in it, Robert was not in it, was shot at a later date, like a week later, two weeks later, because we had to shoot half of Robert's scenes to get all of his stuff. He mm-hmm. went home and then we went back and shot the other half of the scenes that, where he wasn't in the shot. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's the only way to schedule Robert. 
No, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen the movie uh, Night Terrors? No. I know oh, of it, though. Right. It's a very slept on movie and it, it's it's got some flaws but his performance in that as the marquee decide and yeah. the way like hooper lights it and shoots these weird angles it's very psychedelic and very uh just a very good actor yeah he is oh, he's fantastic yeah. right total opposite kind of actor from ted ted stays in character all day long yeah robert turns it on and off ah uh, ted's more like uh, a bit more method yeah well he's from the he's you know, a Steppenwolf guy, Steppenwolf theater group, like, oh, Gary, okay. like Gary Sinise and Malkovich and people like yeah. that. So he's very much like that. I didn't know that one. Actually, so there was actually one scene we were because we were in South Africa mm-hmm. and our the first AD was white. The second AD was black. And we're shooting in this that corridor scene at the end when the man was chasing down the corridor was built in the in the the wood shop. So mm-hmm. you hear saws going on and stuff. So when the first AD would call for quiet, they'd all be quiet. First AD went to the bathroom, gave the set to the second AD, and they, and they wouldn't listen to him mm-hmm. because they weren't going to take orders from a black guy. That's essentially what, what it was. And we're, and we're ready to, we're rolling, and these guys are still sawing. And Ted, in character, goes running out, and I hear him yell, can I swear on this? Yeah. <laughs> He goes, I just hear Ted in character yelling, well, you shut the fuck up. We're trying to make a fucking movie here in that total of weird voice. And he comes back in. We're still rolling. And he, he goes, let's go. And he does the scene. Jesus. <laughs> That's an awesome story. <laughs> he, did it, he did it in character, which is what's hysterical. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, his um, how much of that character that he plays there uh hunting how much of him would you say is like maybe like a little bit of toby's sentiments or a little bit of yours like your personality it's it's a mixture of both you know um Mm -hmm. and it's also just what ted's interpretation of what was on the page sure interesting stuff Mm -hmm. so i was wondering too um you know since the mangler is a short story by stephen king was toby ever interested in like directing other Stephen King stories? Um, we had, right after The Mangler, we had, we were actually going to do The Mist. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, I did a draft of the script and it never came together. So, and then of course, Frank Darabont did it years later. But yeah, we were, we were actually going to do that. It was very preliminary, um, but that's what Toby wanted to do. Gotcha. Well, you know, I'm curious, like, Considering how Darabont's script ends, how did your script end? It ended just like the book with all the, yeah. all the, yeah, we didn't change it. Got you. I mean, I, I have mixed feelings about that. There's some days where I like it, some days where I don't. Yeah, it's just, it's a, I don't know. It's a story that's the setup is better than the payoff. Yeah. Right. yeah. It, I mean, it's about, you know, people turning on each other and I, you know, you get people in a, crowded space and they're trapped you know what do they do it's a great character study of that yeah yeah Yeah, i mean my favorite um stephen king story very underrated i think is the long walk which is kind of a similar Mm -hmm. i don't know if you read it or know about it but you know i've heard of it it, but i haven't yeah it's a story where like it's basically the whole story is just kids um walking in this hiking contest Mm -hmm. and if they go below three miles per hour um they basically get shot so the whole story is just, you know, kids like claustrophobically walking oh. down a road. Oh, sounds very yeah. Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> on that mist thing that was like preliminary, yeah. but like, uh, so was like Hooper kind of having like input on this kind of writing that you did about it? Well, Toby always, you know, we would always write. I would never like do a draft and turn it in. I would I'd go up to his house and write pages and print them and then he'd read them. And then we talk about it and we'd sort of get like the five pages where we wanted it and then go on to the next five pages. It was sort of that kind of give and take. Gotcha. Because I did actually hear you say in, a, in an interview, it was very interesting the way his, his kind of like writing process together with you was that like sometimes he would fix it on like changing a word for like a long time. Yeah, or, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, he would. 
that's sort of that was sort of to be to Toby's way of solving any problem on set. If he if there was a problem, he would just focus on that problem. So, yes, if there was like one word in a line of dialogue that wasn't working, we would stop until he figured out what that word is. So actually he'd go away. He'd leave the he'd leave the, the room and go away for like three or four hours. And mind you, we were working at night. Mm-hmm. So we were because Toby's a night owl. So we were work from like 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And so I was getting a little. Uh, I don't know. I, I was almost having. Like jet lag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like jet lag. And and he had that the clown like that laughing clown from um, from Funhouse in the mm-hmm. I think it was from Funhouse in the office. Right. right. And I would start to hallucinate. I swear that clown would like turn in and look at me, you know, it, when <laughs> I'd be left alone in there for like three hours. <laughs> and then Toby would come back, go, I got it, man. The word is three. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Three. OK, here we go. <laughs> and then we'd move on. Yeah, that that was a process of collaboration. Yes. What's very what's very interesting is that. Uh, so w- when when people when I revisit his films, like the Mangler, I've, I've rewatched the Mangler. I've seen it with my dad. My dad isn't a big movie fan. He's seen the Mangler like almost as much as me. And it's like something about it's very rewatchable. And I think it has to do with the fact that he was uh, Hooper was very, in addition to the people he collaborated with, he was very detail oriented on set yes. and on the page. Yes. Right. Absolutely. He was involved in every little detail. Yes. And it's interesting the way like his, I feel like his filmography has been slept on because he was kind of confined to the genre that he got his first big success in. So people... That ha- happens to everybody. Everybody. <laughs> yes. Pretty much. Not, yeah. Sadly, that's like the nature of it. And yeah. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. You know, it's lack of imagination. I mean, um, I mean, after that, mm-hmm. to be honest, that was the first horror script I ever, ever written. After that, I was a horror writer. And I would turn in scripts that weren't horror to my agent. And he'd go, you can't, I'm not sending this out. You're not a, hor- it's, you're a horror writer. You know, if it happens yeah. with comedic actors, you know, for mm-hmm. years, Tom Hanks, who was on Bosom Buddies as like a nutty comedy guy, wanted to do drama. And they would tell mm-hmm. him, you can't do drama. Right. You're a com- you're a comedian, mm-hmm. right? If people get pigeonholed all the time. It's pretty standard. Yeah, it definitely is. And, but even within that confine, like in the case of Hooper, he he kind of these were like kind of lurid, kind of almost B movie settings. But he was able to instill mm. this kind of attention to detail and this craft that really I think is, is making them, especially now, be yeah. revived. People are noticing what was in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what can you say? Maybe um, whatever might come to mind about like because I know you worked as a special, and then at other times like an optical effects. Person it's all the, on, all, yeah, all the same thing. It's all visual yeah, effects. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. So, like, in the case of like, uh, I think you did Life Force, and you also did Spontaneous Combustion. Well, did Life Force? No, yeah. I, I. That was my first credit. I was a driver in the purchasing department. Oh, I see. <laughs> and yeah. Can, and Canon decided to give everybody at Apogee a credit, which is why it's paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of name. So, Makes it's sense. my first credit, but can't claim to have any real input other than buying things for the model shop um yeah and spontaneous combustion was my first visual effects supervisor job i mean toby wanted john dykstra because he had done life force and invaders from mars and john was busy right and toby said who could you recommend so he sent me and another guy up to his house and i happened to have a reel i'd come back from canada work on a movie called millennium where I was associate visual effects supervisor, and I shot a lot of pyro, a lot of fire, things blowing up and that kind of thing. And I had this reel of pyro, and I showed it to Toby, not knowing that he was interviewing me for spontaneous combustion. (laughs) So he saw all this fire and said, oh, you're the guy. So, okay. Yeah, so that's how that happened. That's really interesting. Um, Yeah, the um, uh, what, what were your, do you remember... Uh, your reactions to that movie and maybe also Toby's reactions to that movie? Uh, spontaneous Combustion? Right. Um, it, it's actually funny. I've just been reading Stan Gies's book about that. Do you know about that book? I have it's, it, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was just reading it. I haven't read it before. Um, yeah. I'm going, oh, I don't remember that. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, it's the thing is with any movie, you work on something for a year, a year and a half, sometimes two years. Mm-hmm. When you watch it, all you can see are the flaws. Mm-hmm. Um, could have been better. I, I, you know, you, that, I mean, that's kind of just the way it is. You know, you so mm-hmm. you sort of judge it by how the audience judges it. If the audience likes it, then you go, yeah, okay, that was cool. Mm-hmm. You know, and also all you can see when you work down that, that intimately is you remember the day you shot that, that it was a long day or it was hot or mm-hmm. you weren't feeling well. I mean, there's all these, you know, other emotions that go along with watching it. I mean, now I can watch it and totally detach from all that. But right afterward, you know, I mean, we both liked it. We both thought, you know, Brad Dourif is terrific. We thought the yeah. effects that were extremely low budget seemed to work. Right. You know, in fact, I used some of those effects trying to convince I was, um, when I was at Disney at Buena Vista Visual Effects, I met with mm-hmm. producer and editor, a producer and, and the director of a movie called Walder Napalm, which was about guys who mm-hmm. catch on fire. And I showed them all these um, shots from spontaneous combustion. And the director looked at me and goes, well, what did you do? That's real. Yeah. Which is the best compliment, right? But I right. said, no, I said, no, if that was real, Specifically, it was a shot of Brad in his car when the fire shoots out of his arm and blasts the windshield. I said, if that was real, yeah. we would have burned Brad's face off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It wasn't real. It was an effect. And he goes, oh, okay. Yeah, because he is like, it seems like he's very close to a lot of these things, especially in that car moment. But you're saying that was like, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, anytime there was a jet of fire, it was all done in post. Then in, in that case, like, you know, my dumb viewer brain, I'm like, now knowing that it's, it's, it's very interesting the way you did that. It's cool. Well, it, yeah. And it was all really low budget. Um, right. I mean, it was the crew it was, I shot everything. It was Toby son, Tony with like a hairspray can and a lighter going, Psh, that's the fire. Right. Yeah. And, and we would like angle the flames properly. And then what we did was have uh, the still photographer at Apogee, Mike Middleton made, um, animation stills like transparencies mm-hmm. and and because they were they were pin registered so that they were all in sync and i went then i went in on the animation stand mm-hmm. and moved the flame and moved it so if like an arm is waving like this that's the animation moving it Jeez. and i reshot that and then gave it to the optical department to put in that's amazing yeah but that's how we had to do it it was so low budget it was tony and i essentially and the so, optical department. Right. And Tony was a very, uh, he had a hand in a lot of, I think, uh, his father's movies. He was yeah. very creative. And, yeah. Tony's, no, Tony's, he, he designed The Mangler. I mean, that, oh, I sure. remember, I remember when he, he came in with a clay mock-up uh-huh. of the machine. And Tony and I both looked at that and go, that's exactly what, it, yes, absolutely. I mean, it was, so that, that actually was FedEx to South Africa. And Tony also designed, how many people know this, the wow. Mangler actually worked. It, you wow. could put a sheet in the front. It would yeah. go through the rollers and come out the back. The only part that did not work perfectly, and that's because we ran out of time building it, was wow. it didn't quite fold, but it was close. So yeah. that was actually, and then he, and, yeah. design, and he also designed it so that the rollers could move the front roller and the mm-hmm. one behind it. And there was like a little stunt area in there. So if a person went in, they would drop down onto the stunt pad oh, right behind, okay. right behind the, that main conveyor belt and that big roller. And yeah. Tony, Tony designed all of that. Tony was, is a genius. I mean, he yeah. must've been like really young too. And like, he had no experience with that kind of stuff. He was probably, Let's see. This was nice. He was probably yeah. He was in his twenties. No, oh, cool. Nice. What about what about in spontaneous when there's that? To me, I think it holds up amazingly well. Like when the the fire arm like reaches out of the mirror and like yes, to, yeah. How's yeah. that done? Do you know? Well, that I do know. I shot yeah. it. It was exactly. it was a Tony made a mechanical arm. 
uh -huh. that we put some sort of uh, gel on it, something that burned. I forget what it was. Right. Um, and the way to make it look like it's really popping is the, sh the scene was shot, the plate of the mirror and over, I think it's over, it was it Brad or was it, it was it Cynthia? That Cynthia. Had the arm kind of, Cynthia, over her shoulder, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So we probably shot with like a normal sort of lens, 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we shot the arm coming out with a slightly wider lens, which exaggerated that movement. Ah. So that's how it looks like it's 3D and it's actually coming at her. Because if we shot with a 35 millimeter lens, it'd look kind of flat. Well, it does look really, really amazingly well today. Yeah, um, that yeah. That's awesome. Uh, maybe one last thing about Spontaneous is... Uh, sure. Yeah, because like... I don't know if you've seen Eggshells. That's uh, Toby's first yes. movie. Yeah. I, I saw the, the VHS that Toby had. He let me borrow it. He had Damn. it... He had it on on VHS. Yeah, that's a trip. Uh, that movie. <laughs> yeah, it's a very psychedelic narrative, and yeah. um, if you see it on that level, it is very interesting. It's not like it's surprising. Toby's a child of the sixties. He was a hippie. He would say things like "far out, man." Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, and, and that kind of like hippie uh, mentality and attitude, I think, permeates a lot of his themes and in his work and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And like the right. emphasis on the workers and the mangler and how they're kind of mistreated and, you know. Yep. I, it's interesting. I've, I've read reviews where people say it's a, like an anti-capitalist manifesto. <laughs> and it's like, I wouldn't quite go that far. But yes, he, but he was consciously showing the exploitation of workers. Yeah. And, and the machinery of the industry, how it dehumanizes. That was all very conscious on his part. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the one thing about the story that's actually really scary is like, you know, when you think about it, you have people every day who work in factories and they're not getting like proper safety equipment. They're not right. like, they're not getting the things they need to and they still have to go to work and like risk their lives. It's like right. scary shit every day, you know? So yeah, the movie kind of really taps into that idea. Absolutely, working on an assembly line with the sheen or going, you know? Yeah. Yeah, or in a machine shop or in a wood shop, you know, one little slip up and you lose a limb. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, like the, the machine itself was terrifying, like, you know, especially for something that was made, you know, in the 90s. Like, I was scared looking at it when I saw the movie. Yeah. It was. It was terrifying in person. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I imagine. Yeah. And that's what Stephen King does really well in like stories like The Mangler, like in his big novel it there's a uh, the clown or the laundry machine are like mm. kind of a like an encapsulation of these like horrifying environments whether it's like a bad workplace or whether it's uh you know uh when you're an adolescent and the bullies and um that kind of like you know those machines or those monsters tap into that kind of fear or manifest that kind of fear right i mean i was told that stephen king when he was putting himself through college worked in an industrial laundry I mean, these things exist. You go into the lobby, I mean, lobby, you go into the basement of a hotel or something, and they have these things called mangles, which aren't quite as terrifying as the mangler. But if you get your arm caught in one, you're in trouble. And they really yeah. are just for pressing sheets and on an industrial level. So he had experience with those and I'm sure saw some accidents. And that's where the yeah. idea came from. Yeah, I know a long time ago, I think I read that. Um, yeah, like you said, he worked at one of those like industrial washer places mm. and he knew a guy there who actually lost both of his hands um, mm. working on one of the machines and the guy had hooks for hands. So he used oh. to go up, go up behind people and like put cold water on the, uh, the thing and <laughs> put them on their shoulders to like scare the crap out of them from <laughs> behind. That's very funny. Yeah. I mean, not funny the guy lost his hands, but the, yeah. at least, at least he had, he had, a, he had a sense of humor about it. Yeah. This is um, a detour, but um, uh, maybe what can you say about like your relationship with uh, Jeremy Crushley on Flytrap and his career and how it changed over the years? Since? It, it, well, I mean, during The Mangler, I remember saying to him distinctly in 1994, I said, you're going to star in a movie for me one day. It took nice. a few years, but he, it, what was funny is I remember watching Black Sails, which shot in South Africa. 
And I looked it up and I go, oh, this is anytime any big production shot in South Africa, he would be in it. And I saw that he was in black sales. I said, that's fantastic. And I had a British friend who, I don't know, six months after black sales aired, said to me, I have a friend coming to my birthday party um, named Jeremy Crutchley. Do you know him? I go, yes. And Jeremy showed up. There he was. He, and he was moving to L.A. I actually met him in London, tried to get him in my first film, Heads and Tails, he wanted to do. Right. But we couldn't squ squeeze the uh, work out the scheduling. But, yeah, he was here and living here. And I didn't know I was doing Flytrap yet. That kind of happened by accident. And once I got the funding, I said the, the investors. Oh, I know what it was. I was in New York. Mm -hmm. He was doing his one man show, Sacred Elephant. Mm -hmm. And the investors, that's when I met the investors accidentally met these lawyers and they go here, do you want money for a movie? Yeah, sure. And I invited them to the show. And one of the investors turned to me and said, can we get Jeremy in our movie? I go, I think so. <laughs> and I asked him and he said, yes. And away we went. It was great. <clears throat> That's awesome. That's a really, I saw that movie uh, last night for the first time. <laughs> um, it, it's weird. <laughs> no, weird in a really good way. <laughs> It's very, um, it kept me guessing, and it was uh, low-key, obviously, with the budget, but it was very yeah. visually, like, the choice of colors, you know, these, like, ocean blues and greens. and Yeah. And the inscrutability of some of the characters you don't really know much about at first. Yes. I found that fascinating. Yeah. Like Gilligan. Yes. <laughs> Jonah. Jonah is yeah. so, I, I love Jonah. He's so not that character. He is so completely different. He just immersed himself in that. Right. That character in particular, I remember uh, I was watching the scene where there's some kind of like, uh, maybe it's like a rock song or something playing as uh, Crutchley is bonding with the girl. Yes. And he's just like, at first you see him in the shadows. You can't really see him. He's obscured. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. he comes comes out of the shadows and then you cut to like a close up of his face. Yeah. It's almost like a robot registering like, the, you know, like uh, anger and like uh, jealousy. It's very, very, I've never seen something like that. In really well, well, the thing I said to the, to Ina, who played Marianne and Jonah, I said, you know, you're here's the acting problem. You're humans trying to be aliens, trying to be human. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing I said to them. And then Jonah would did it by trying to be insect like. If you notice, he doesn't move. He's very still. He doesn't blink. Right. Uh, that was a deliberate. He's trying to look robotic. Yeah. He really captured that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Creepy. <laughs> very creepy yeah and it, it's a it's a very um another thing about that movie that, that was interesting is very it was surprisingly tender like hmm. yeah i didn't expect to come away from the movie thinking that but it was yeah, sweet in a way well good i'm glad you got that thanks <laughs> <laughs> you directed some music videos i think recently right mm -hmm. or over the yeah 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 the i'm i'm, I'm bad with this it's the terror ways i think yes yeah um, is there anything that you've learned on or maybe uh, instills from your filmmaking days onto those music video projects? I mean, I just ignore all the rules of filmmaking, kind of, because a music video doesn't, you don't have to worry about eye lines. You don't have to worry about how you cover a scene. You just need to shoot a bunch of stuff and cut it. I mean, I, I mean, I, I do try to follow a theme and a concept, right. you know, um, and my style always comes from the characters mm -hmm. so in the sense i try to get a sense of the song so the style fits the song mm -hmm. so yes in that sense yes so you hear the song you kind of get a real good sense of it and then you well and and i will listen you know i get the lyrics and i look at the lyric but I'll also ask them i'll ask the songwriters i'll go if, if it's an original song i'll say what inspired this you know and right, they'll tell me the story. Or if it's a cover, I'll say, why are you picking this? How is this speaking to you? And then I use that as a launching point. That's really cool. And I think I heard you say that you were a fan of Kubrick. Yeah. Oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I think 2001 is when you realize, like, yeah, there was a vision behind the camera. Exactly. That was exactly it. Yes. Right. Because I, I remember, like, in, in some of his films, his, his, the way he would cut to music, and edit to music. Yeah. Like in Clockwork Orange. To me, it was very interesting. Um, 
was there anything like you learned in like films that like uh, the way it's edited to music by certain directors maybe that or you gave me a good answer already yeah it's not it, it i mean for me they're almost completely separate forms music videos and and i my music videos i tend to really go gorilla it's just me with a camera i may light i may not light and i just go and shoot and just sort of feel it feel the moment try to capture the spontaneity of it interesting and then uh another related thing you've said in an interview that was really interesting was that uh i think the interviewer was assuming that like you know there was always you know if it's like a visionary filmmaker like a kubrick or like a whomever there's always that kind of uh they're leading everything you pointed out that filmmaking is very much filmmaking by committee at all times unless you're doing what you just described yes well you're i mean the director has to lead i mean the director has to set the tone it's you know but but like i like to tell people as i start working with them i say but if you have an idea I'm open to it. I'm, you know, if the DP has an idea about, I want to go with a wide angle lens handheld and they're saying, no, let's go on a Lumicrane long lens. I'll go and have them explain it to me. I'll just think about it. And maybe I'll go, you know what? That's a better idea. Let's use it. I don't care where the idea comes from, but you have to have some idea and you have to be able to use the other ideas that still fit the whole vision. Otherwise it's just a mess. Right. So it's, some people refer to it as a benevolent dictatorship directing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but every director is different. Um, I, mm-hmm. I've worked, you know, my visual effects days work with directors who don't want any ideas. They just say, do it like this. And you do it like that. That's that works, too. Yeah, there's a few different approaches to that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so someone wants to know if. Uh, this is kind of a question I've already asked you, you know, was Hunton and, uh, and Mark, those characters in the Mangler, were they modeled on Toby or his sensibilities? And think, you know. Well, Mark, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> Mark was much more Toby. I guess if you look at it that way, Hunton was much more me and Mark was much more Toby. That makes that, sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> one, <laughs> uh, both really good characters, but there's something about um, Hunton that is, very you know he kind of reminds me of like somebody who's just woken up all the time like he's yes. just like and yeah, i yeah. love that yeah yeah by and the way like liked, the, the actor who played mark wrote night terrors that's right yeah danny met right yeah um who does a very good job in that role yeah no he's good yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little lost but i think that's uh the gist of it <laughs> okay okay Cool, man. Oh, um, was there anything else that you wanted to add that comes to mind? No, it's just it's nice seeing people get this movie. It's it's funny. I mean, even movies where I, I, I wasn't like I worked in the visual effects department on Spaceballs. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the first day of shooting Flytrap, Ina who plays Marianne because to me goes, you work on Spaceballs? I go, yeah. She goes, I love that movie. I go, really? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's another one of those movies that is now appreciated. It wasn't when it came out. So that's, that kind of interests me. It's interesting how some of these movies I worked on, I thought, okay, you know, it, it didn't work. People didn't like it. And all of a sudden they're like, it. it's like, wow. Okay. I love that. that nice right. surprise. No, exactly. Um, were, were you, um, I just want to know maybe your, your initial reaction, I mean, your general reaction to that kind of curve, because I think when The Mangler was released, I think it was basically dismissed upon its premise and, and, and interpreted right. unidimensionally. Like they only wanted to right. see it as like, yeah, right. they didn't see the layer suit. How, what, are you, what are your reactions to the way it's been like kind of obviously re, you know, evaluated? Well, I think what's interesting is a lot of the criticism people had early on were actually critiques of the short story they hadn't read because we were pretty faithful to the short story. People who knew the short story, who really had read it, totally got the movie, but critics didn't, Um, you know? So I think now the people who are discovering it are either there's this tsunami of love for toby hooper movies life force invaders from mars i mean it's interesting right 
Mm -hmm. And I think those are the people, the people discovering it are people who know the short story and know Toby or know his work. And I think that's the best part. I only wish Toby was still here to, to take this all in because he would have yeah. loved this. You would have loved interviewing him. It was, <laughs> he was a trip, man. I, that's yeah. my only regret is that he's not here to see this resurgence in love for his movies. Mm -hmm. yeah and no, the books that are coming out right the books about him i just got the one from the university of austin um i forget what it's called american master is that the scout was that scouts was like the cinema goth figure or something that maybe it was i don't know yeah. what it but it was the, it's a hardcover and yeah. i know it's uh, like university of austin press it's like a scholarly work but all these right. you know and stan's book it's great that people are going this wait wait a minute this guy yeah. was this guy was terrific I love that. I just wish he was here to see it. No, I, I share that sentiment. I mean, um, he he's definitely what I consider like an underdog filmmaker. Like I've never geeked out on a filmmaker since like Stanley Kubrick when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really a big horror fan, but something about the fact that like he made undeniably great films and then kind of had this other kind of like uh, evaluation of him that I, that I wanted to explore. Like, is that true? Like, and it really surprised me what I found. And I love, that's what makes me a fan of him that he was mm. yeah yeah and did, did he ever this was one of the fan questions that i remembered um did he ever like mention his like uh his attitude towards like the big producers so like when he was working for spielberg or harry allen towers or you know <laughs> Cannon. well well okay those are two opposite ends of the spectrum um <laughs> true yeah <laughs> harry i mean harry was a bit of a scoundrel right. um but you knew where you stood with harry um he, he just, all he ever would say about Harry was, I mean, Harry was fairly hands off on during the production. He was, you know. he tried to get involved in the writing, but he just, but, but he didn't write any of it. He, I don't know how he ended up with a credit, but, right. um, but Toby had knew who Harry was and sort of dealt with him. And, you know, he wasn't the kind of producer that Toby disliked because um, he didn't interfere. Now, and his relationship, most people don't know this. His relationship with Steven Spielberg was fantastic. Yeah. He, once a year, he would get invited to Amblin. This is before the DreamWorks days and go spend two hours in his office just talking movies. Mm -hmm. Every year they had that meeting. Steven loved him. That's why he hired him to do dark, shoot. I think the pilot for dark skies and some other right. series, he kept giving Taking. him work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember hand delivering a, a VHS of the Mangler to Stephen's office. I didn't meet him, but I saw his assistant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he loved, loved Stephen. He, they had a, you know, this, this notion of animosity or that Stephen directed Poltergeist is all that all of that comes from people who were not there. Exactly. Who don't know what really went down. It's just unfortunate, you know, that Toby was the first of these Steven Spielberg produced movies because Robert Zemeckis didn't get that treatment. Mm -hmm. Joe Dante didn't get that treatment. People started to accept him as a producer, mm -hmm. you know, who made movies that looked Spielberg ask, but he didn't direct them. Right. And it's the same with Poltergeist. So I'm glad you touched upon this subject because I've done a lot of research on this topic and mm. I know Toby Hooper directed the movie. He was down in the trenches making that movie every day in that tight 90 day schedule. Yeah. And um, Toby had done that before, like on Salem's Lot. It was like he had to do like three times as many setups a day with a fraction of the time and he barely slept. But the result is a phenomenal movie that stands the test of time. And I yeah. think Spielberg saw an example like that and he knew that not only was he capable of directing that big budgeted effort of Poltergeist, but that they obviously shared the same sentiments and visions to be able to right. collaborate in the first place. Most people don't think of Toby as being part of this group, but in the 70s, and Toby was actually one of the, the pioneers, right? In the 70s, Francis Coppola was, no pun intended, sort of the godfather because he was five, six, seven years older than all these other guys. But there was Toby, who had his massive hit with Texas Chainsaw Massacre long before Friedkin 
and Spielberg and Brian De Palma Mm -hmm. and all these guys, Scorsese, this group of directors, Toby was part of that group. And Francis Coppola was, you know, who was older, ha- was sort of their spirit guide in a way. And Toby had the earliest success of all of them. And people, and so he knew Stephen from back in the day. Yeah, I think he said that Spielberg really loved um, Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's when people start talking about, it, I read it about how, Toby didn't direct Poltergeist. I just, it just pisses me off. It's like, come on, guys. You're repeating a rumor that's so untrue. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a real shame because, um, like, Spielberg got involved with, like, big, elaborate special effects shots or whatever, some of them. And and if you look at this, like, seven-minute making of doc, uh, behind the scenes yeah. of Poltergeist, Hooper, people think that they, it, like, it sells the case that, like, Spielberg directed it. And then you, if you're a Hooper fan, you can make out his voice and you can see what, it, what he looks like with his beard yes. and everything. I Seen mean, multiple it, times there, yeah. I mean, Stephen was a, a producer, so he was there. And, right. you know, and, and there are so many stills of him looking through the camera mm-hmm. that people think, well, he must have directed it. I mean, and anytime anybody starts talking about how Toby didn't direct Poltergeist, I say, go ask Mick Garris. Yes. He was the publicist on that show. He was there every day. Right. He knows. Right. Yeah. And him and a lot of the actors who worked on it and a lot of the, uh, the, the crew members, you know. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's that old saying. It's, you know, once a lie is out there or an untruth, it, the truth can never overtake it. It just, right. it's unfortunate. Right. The, the, the myth of the controversy, you know, endures more. In it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And maybe a, a last question. Um, mm-hmm. Was there any of like, Hooper kind of had like, a, he was he was relegated to very low budget projects like in the 90s. He, his television work in the 90s is very good. Like there was something he did called Nowhere Man. Yes, I was on that set. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I mean, I didn't yeah. work on it. I was just visiting. But yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was like an amazing story and and well directed and, and visually a mix of like you know German expressionist filmmakers and kind of Hitchcock. Yeah. Oh, actually, wait a minute. I did work on it. There was one shot where he wakes up. His Bruce Greenwood's wife is Megan Gallagher, and she has no face. And she's got eyes though. Like... There's. It looks like it's just no. It's oh, like yeah, a no blank, face. Yeah, it's like a blank face. I did work on that. Right. For some reason I... that was a nut. That effect was a nightmare. Yeah, I, I, it never really worked, but but yes, that's right. I forgot I was on. I, I worked on that just for a little bit because I do remember that shot very vividly now. Yeah. No face, yeah. Um, so his his TV work like on Dark Skies is really good. Taken with Spielberg is very good. He worked with Spielberg like three times in TV. Yeah, um, yeah. And he many he had like a quiet renaissance in the two thousands, and 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 I think until Jin because I think Jin's a very underrated movie. But um, like, did you ever see like Toolbox Murders or something like that? Yep. Yep. Do you like that? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a certain, you know, sometimes people just need a job. Right. Some people forget that directing is a job. You know? That's true. And he also, Toby also said something very interesting to me. He, he was referring to David Lean, but he goes, you know, he goes, the director probably has a good director, three really good movies in them. They may make 10, but there are only three they'll be remembered for. So, and I thought that was incredibly profound that it's true, but just because, I mean, going into making a movie, the odds are stacked against you. It's so complicated. It doesn't matter if it's big budget, low budget. It doesn't matter how experienced the crew or the director, you're reinventing the wheel every time. And right. no matter how meticulously you plan, things go wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's a miracle the movie works in the end. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's sobering, you know, but it's, uh, it's true. It's just the nature of the business. I mean, it's a, you know, mm-hmm. a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I used to want to be a filmmaker when I was young. And now as an adult, I think. My my temperament is so not up to that pace and whatnot. 
So I'm glad I never. You have to really, you have to really, yeah, you have to want to put up with all the the bullshit in order to do it. You know, it's yeah obstacles exactly. every every step of the way. Exactly. Do you have any like um, anything you've written recently that you plan on wanting to do into a movie or something? Um, yeah, I actually, it, I can't say too much about this, but there was a press release about uh, this rock and roll punk movie about an all-female punk band I'm doing oh. called Meet the Pumps, where Linda Perry is doing the music. Yeah. Um, so that we're moving ahead with. We don't have a start date yet, but. Good. If that, yeah, I look forward to that, seeing something like that. Yeah, at least something totally different. Totally different from everything else. Good. And um, you say like genre doesn't really matter to you? You know. The genre comes from the story. Um, I've written uh, thrillers. I've written dramas. I've written fantasy. You know, Mm -hmm. it's a matter of when I have the idea, the genre comes from, well, what is this? Oh, it's a thriller. Okay, it's about this kind of character. Or it's a fantasy because it's a different version of our world or whatever. As opposed to taking, a, I don't pick a genre and then write to the genre. It's the other way around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, did you ever think that like you would wind up being like, uh, I guess, Toby's close friend and, and protege? Never in a million years. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, on Life Force, when I was a driver, I'd see him around the facility, around Apogee. Mm-hmm. And, um, on Invaders from Mars when I was a motion control assistant and on set shooting plates, I'd, you know, be hanging out with Dykstra and he'd be talking to Toby. Toby didn't know who I was. So I was sort of Toby adjacent for a long time before I actually met him. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was a sign that we were going to work together. No, I never. It's the, the opportunities in my career have always come out of left field. Never planned or anything. I mean, I would, yeah, I was, you know, I worked with Toby on Spontaneous Combustion and I went on and did other visual effects work. And I was at Disney, Buena Vista Visual Effects on a stage. It was after Dick Tracy. It mm-hmm. was after well, it was after Wilder Napalm, actually, which was that other fire movie. Right. And I'm on the stage working on something. And mm-hmm. call comes through and it's Toby. I hadn't ta- spoken to him in a couple of years, maybe three years. And he just kind of said, hey, man, have you ever written horror? I said, yes, lying, but I, I thought about telling him the truth, but good thing I didn't. And he goes, oh, man, pick up a copy of The Mangler. Tell me how you turn it into a movie. Come see me. So I, OK, walked into Harrison Allen's office and I said, I got to I told him what happened. He goes, OK, take the day off. I mm-hmm. thought nothing would come of it. I'd go back to be working visual effects the next day. N- next morning, it's after the pitch and he called Stephen King. And next morning I was a professional screenwriter. Boom. Oh, it's like, oh. OK. Yeah, um, I was wondering, too, because I uh, lost my train of thought for a second. It's going to come <laughs> back in two seconds. Uh, oh, yeah. So out of all of the uh, short stories that Toby could have done for Stephen King, mm-hmm. um, what was his incentive for, like, choosing the Mangler specifically? I think it chose him because Harry Allen Towers um, produced Night Terrors. And Harry had the rights to the Mangler. And Toby may have been actually involved in securing the rights. It may have been the two of them. I don't know. Um, but I think Harry said, what do, what do you think about doing the Mangler? And I think he thought, hey, another Stephen King thing? Absolutely. So I think it sort of chose him, I think. Because had the other producers made the Mangler, I don't think they would have picked Toby to direct it. So, Yeah. Would have been a totally different movie, too. Probably. Well, yeah. Yes. And we wouldn't be sitting here talking. You'd be talking to Brett Leonard or something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the Salem's Lot um, miniseries? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, there's actually something. Well, there's another one being shot now. You know. Oh, true. Yeah, yeah there is a yeah. Mm-hmm. I look forward to that. I know there was also one with uh, Rob Lowe at some point. Mm. Um. But in the Mangler, there's the moment where, you know, with the fridge, when the ghost <laughs> burst out of it, right. which is amazing. Really, like, I'm like, I'm thinking, like, what the hell am I watching first time I see it? Yeah. 
But um, most people had that right. Most people had that reaction. Yes. It's so amazing. <laughs> and then to top it off, the, the fact that like the, the picture man, he doesn't have like one reaction shot, one line. Right. It's like one, then the next, then the next, yeah, then the yeah. next. Each one is gold. And it's so it's like he doesn't let the it's just amazing. I don't know. No, Toby knew how to milk a moment, how to, you know, how right. to build tension and release tension. And yeah, like you're saying, I learned, too. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about directing from him. I learned, I remember the day actually he taught me about eye lines. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about eye lines. And he taught me how you, you know, sometimes you want to keep you, oftentimes you want to keep the eyes close to the lens. So an actor, if the camera's here, actor might off camera, like, Camera, lens is pointing out might lean into the camera this way to draw the eye line of the other person or get mm-hmm. the other actor to pick an eye usually the eye closer to the camera to look at not the one mm-hmm. farther from the camera so these tiny little eye line differences mm-hmm. make a difference you know and he taught me about that and he said what do you think of that i go i think that's pretty cool he goes steven told steven taught me that but okay wow so Mm-hmm. One step removed, I learned eye lines from Steven Spielberg, though I never met him. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot of this, that the technical aspects of filmmaking, you know, about yeah. coverage and things you don't learn in film school. Right. Things that, you know, yeah, he was very open that way. And actually, when I, he was very complimentary. I, I conceived of Heads and Tails, my first directing job. What, right. um, in Paris with him, we had just come back from a screening of The Mangler. And I'd said, I have this idea for a movie about two criminals who flip a coin each day to figure out what, who's going to kill or do what needs to be done. I'm going to call it Heads or Tails. He goes, no, man, call it Heads and Tails. Then it's a buddy movie. <laughs> so I went back to the hotel. I scribbled some notes. And when I went home in two weeks, I had a draft. So I eventually, you know, six years later, showed him the movie, went to his house. And he just, and he, he was like, he was grinning. He was smoking a cigar, drinking his pet Dr. Pepper and grinning ear to ear. And when it was done, he goes, all right, man, welcome to the club. <laughs> you know, that, he was very supportive that way. He didn't, you know, he, if someone wanted to go direct, he, he, he gave them his blessing, he, you know, which was great. That's really awesome. So like you showed him, like, I still got to see that movie heads, heads and tails. Yeah, it, should, it's, yeah. It's not in distribution at the moment, but I can send you a link. Um, yeah, Amazing. I showed him a DVD of it. Yeah, that's so cool because he he kind of like he taught you uh, the crux of like how to like you know structure a script and you know little yeah. I, I mean, he was the one who when we were writing, he said he asked me. He said, "You ever heard of John Truby?" I said, "No." He goes, "You should." So back then, John Truby is one of these writing gurus, right? Writing gurus. Right. Um, and he had a videotape series on his 22 structure points. So I watched that and that helped me definitely through the Mangler. If you look at the Mangler, it's a perfect John Truby 22 step script. I now break the rules a bit because I'm more adept at the story structure, but right. Mangler's definitely, you look at there and go, Oh, there's the ghost. Okay. There, you know, there's the inciting event. There's, you can like tick through it. 22 steps. <laughs> right. It's interesting. Um, uh uh the um uh, i was gonna say real quick when, with the refrigerator scene before leading up to that on a rewatch i noticed a level of depth that kind of like i just didn't expect at all like uh when the kid's being like uh, pulled away on the gurney the dog is like crying and like uh, uh, <laughs> i love that that's like a, such a small detail that i missed but like that was probably just accidental i mean you can't direct mm-hmm. the dog well, you really can, yeah. <laughs> Good accent. I never noticed that, but okay. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But but you know, but but the thing is, if it, if there's an attention to detail, somehow other details creep in, yeah. like that. That's what I. That's part of the alchemy of filmmaking, right? The magic of it. Yeah, I guess like you know, if like a certain mood is achieved on set, I guess certain things just kind of find their way in. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And there is the mom chasing after the gurney when it's being pulled away into the ambulance. That I don't think was in, I don't remember that in the short story, but I do remember that like as something reminiscent of Salem's lot, which I love that kind of, Mm. he he revived those little King tropes. That's also a Toby moment, right? That kind of thing. Of course. Like the, 
when the two workers or the two paramedics are taking the that basket of blood <laughs> soaked sheets and stuff body parts to the ambulance right and they sort of accidentally bang it against the back of the bumper before they <laughs> put it in that's a toby right toby does that's the toby humor effect that kind of yeah. thing yeah <laughs> yeah like the the humor mixed with the black you know the blackness of it right yeah i, I got a live question <laughs> You don't mind? Uh, no, absolutely. I just realized cool. my lighting has gone very surreal, but all right. I was wondering, did it like get some? No, no it, it got dark. dark. Yeah, the, oh, yeah. Can you still see me? I see you. Yeah. I probably look very scary now, but that's okay. It's appropriate, it's appropriate. for this. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It fits. This is just kind of a general one. Did, did Toby talk at all about what direction he felt our country was heading? <laughs> well, he. I mean, you know, he was, like I said, he was a hippie. Right. So he, you know, he, he kept talking about Texas Chainsaw Massacre as an anti-Vietnam War film. I still don't get that, but I'm sure there's something in there that, you know, you know but he never, he wasn't really, didn't talk much about politics and stuff. Toby talked about movies. Go to his house. There was always Magnificent Ambersons playing on one screen Pulp Fiction playing on another screen. It's like just movies, 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 movies. That was his entire life. At least yeah. with me, he never talked about anything else. Yeah. Well, I think what's really cool is like, um, you know, around like the 60s or the 70s, you know, like post Vietnam, like that's where so many horror movies became very violent and very mm. gory. And it's almost kind of like a reflection of, of what a lot of people were probably seeing on TV at the time and just, you know, the everything going on. Well, the war was, you know, film of the war was being shown on the nightly news. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it's funny how people. So when people call Texas Chainsaw Massacre a slasher film and gory, there's absolutely no gore in it. Yeah. He couldn't, he couldn't afford it, <laughs> which actually made it better. Yeah. When people say it was the world. You know, it's such a gory movie. It's like, no, that's your imagination. Go back and watch yeah. it. Yeah, because like even the scene when um when Pam gets put on the hook, people remember that scene and they think of it as being really gory. You don't yeah. see anything in that scene. No, you just it's her screaming, right? Yeah. It's the sound of the, the hook going through the skin, but that's really it. Yeah. yeah. And like the really disturbing part too is, you know, it's, it's I always remember this. Like when her body goes in, everything just goes silent for a second and like yeah, yeah. her mouth opens and like she's screaming, but nothing's coming out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah visceral you know yeah yeah that's a cool moment very toby very toby <laughs> i don't know how this might relate to uh, like mangler or anything but on chainsaw i heard toby say at con in 2014 in an interview that he wanted the cast to hate him and it was very hot oh. that summer in texas oh, and horrible. he knew yeah right and he that adds to the acting by itself but also his direction was so that like he knew that the audience would soak up the fear hmm. of these. Well, I'd people. never heard him. He, he never said that. I've never heard him say that he wanted the actors to hate him. But I do know. I mean, he described the not just the heat and the humidity when they shot, but yeah. you know when they were like animal parts and stuff on the set. It just all rotted. It just people would walk on the set and start vomiting. I mean, it was it was a real horror show. Mm -hmm. Visceral and horrible, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it was also because they couldn't afford to replace it. It just was function of the budget, but it worked. Right. Yeah, happy accident. I just can't imagine Toby wanting actors to hate him, though. But maybe yeah. he. But if he said that in an interview, maybe he really did it. I mean, I've never seen. seen him, I've, I've never seen him do that. Right. But, like Mangler, there when she's burned, like it really feels like a burn victim. Like she's really like. Uh, yeah, but I don't think Toby was like you know poking or anything behind. No, oh, no, like that. no, that was no, that was just no, that was just makeup and acting. And acting, yeah, yeah, right. Oh, this one's pretty simple, I guess. Kind of falls in line with what we just mentioned, but uh, did did Toby talk at all about like kind of the Mangler being like a metaphor for Hollywood? He talked about it being a metaphor for industrialism, but not Hollywood. No. So like industrialism in general. Yeah, yeah. You know, assembly lines and, you know. And it's know. very anachronistic. Like, it's hard to tell what it's modern and it's like. Right. It, yeah. It's intended to be 
you know, like something from the industrial revolution. That's why there's all that steam. Like it has a steam, like you can imagine this big steam cylinder in the middle of it, powering it and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's intended exactly. to be sort of timeless, sort of retro yeah. and sort of timeless. You don't know what, other than the cars and the, and, and, and the age of the cars were only dictated by the fact that there was only one left hand do we drive in the left in America? <laughs> left hand drive Jeep in South Africa. Oh, there's actually, there was actually a problem where in one scene, Ted kicks in the passenger side door. Mm-hmm. And with the assumption, you know, you're shooting in LA, they'll just come in and replace the door or find another Jeep. Well, that was the only one and Damn. they couldn't fix it. So we had to shoot the Jeep on the other side for the entire rest of the movie. <laughs> That's <laughs> other than that, other than that, that's the only thing that tells you a time period, really. And then there's also like the uniforms of the police, which was a little it's very interesting. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, those were like off the shelf South African wardrobe. Oh, so it was a little. But it fit. It, it looked like something out of the 50s. Right. It, it, right. Yeah. So it, it worked. Yeah. And then the, the, the I don't know how to say it. The Matai paintings, matte paintings. Of matte the painting. sky, matte, matte paintings, yeah. yeah. The matte paintings, yeah. Um, adds a lot to that because, he, like, uh, Gartley describes, you know, you must have wondered how it's so, you know, ideally perfect, you know, this town, right? Theory. And then you look at the paintings and it's like something's off in like an uncanny way, right? Well, it's yeah. also, I mean, we had to use the paintings because Johannesburg looks nothing like Portland, Maine, <laughs> <laughs> and we actually it took us weeks to find because every Every house in Johannesburg has a giant wall around it. Really? So we accidentally driving to the production office one day found that street where Hunton's house is and Mark, where they live next door. The reason they live next door is because those four houses on that street were the only houses we could find in Johannesburg that kind of looked kind of American and didn't have a wall around them. Oh. So the, yeah, and the matte paintings, you know, were, that was Paul Lazane at Buena Vista Visual Effects, great map painter. It was intended yeah. to be overly idyllic, right? Because it's, yeah. it's it's almost the imagination of what the town should be as opposed to what it really is. Right. That adds like a, a dimension of eeriness to it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Cool. I really, I really appreciate your time and everything. No, I love talking about this. It's, you know. Yeah. It's just, it, like I said, it's so nice. People are now liking it and getting it and watching it over and over again and really getting all the stuff Toby wanted to put into it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I Scout uh, Tafoya, I interviewed him in my last video. He mm-hmm. wrote the book, um, one, of the, one of the books. He uh, said, I'm, I don't know much about like old horror films, but he said that like you look at um, I think it was the dorm that dripped blood and you look at like Mother's Day. It's kind of early 70s horror films. Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre didn't have the problems that those movies had, whether they're technical or whether they're like something about the dialogue. Like a lot of his movies are like, you know, even within their limitations, they're very like airtight and uh, even eaten alive, which he said, hmm. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Tonally, it's all over the map. It's crazy, but yeah, it doesn't have those problems. Well, you know, what's interesting is he told me that Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mind you, it was shot on 16 millimeter, right? Yeah. So he told me that when he came to L.A. to mix the sound, mm-hmm. there's a specific way you mark up work print and there's edge code on the side of the work print that tells the negative cutter where to cut the negative, right? You have to match the negative of the work print. If you don't do that properly, Mm-hmm. You actually lose because they glue the the negative is glued. They scrape a little bit of the emulsion off and they glue it. There's no tape, so it's and mm-hmm. when it was marked up, they didn't take into account the fact that you lose a frame every time you cut negative and glue. So right. when they got to LA to mix the film based on based on the pre-recorded tracks and a work print struck from the cut negative, mm-hmm. every shot was off by one frame. What they do about that? They had to go back and remix and like rework the sound to fit it to the one frame off. 
it's not like nowadays in Pro Tools that would be an easy fix. But back then, you're cutting tape. I mean, it yeah. was it was, you know, and you couldn't just cut the if there's a music cue, you can't just cut a frame out because if the music cue over a sh- two shots, the music will jump. So it it, right. it was a nightmare. So it's funny you talk about the technical aspects of chainsaw, and here was a major hurdle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good story. Did you have like any other off the cusp kind of like uh, like a story he might have told you about the, the making of maybe a film you were involved in or any others? The only, I mean, the only thing was I was still working with him is after the Mangler when they decided to do an HD transfer. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget what company. Um, and they actually, and we were in a, a transfer suite and they had found original footage in a lab in Pittsburgh. The, whoever did the restoration found footage all over the place. Really? Yeah. And they were transferring, they put up a reel. Yeah. And it was this bright, it was actually the shot of, I think it's Sally going into the house when the camera dollies under the swing. Yeah. Pushing into the house. And right. it was this beautiful, colorful Kodachrome look. Mm-hmm. And people are used to seeing chainsaw, desaturated, grainy. And that was just bad work prints. The yeah. original was this bright, colorful film and toby goes oh man i don't remember it looking like that (laughs) (laughs) and that was a dilemma because they're doing the restoration and toby is trying to decide do i fulfill the expectations of the the fans and make it look like the work print Mm -hmm. release prints or do i make it look like it should look and he goes he didn't know what to do and i said well let me ask you this. I pointed to the screen. I go, is that how you envision the film? He goes, yes. I go, well, there's your answer. Mm-hmm. So they went back and, and did that. And they, they also went to this place in Burbank, took the mono soundtrack and turned it into stereo, which I don't know how they did that. But yes. um, so th- <laughs> that was, so that was actually just interesting working with him on that restoration. I mean, since there've been other restorations, there's a 4k now, I think. Um mm-hmm. Hopefully they kept the colors. I haven't, I haven't checked it out, but I mean, that was, that was interesting to me that to, to see how the film really was supposed to look, no one had seen that. Right. Daniel yeah. Pearl never saw it. Nobody ever saw it. Yeah. When I interviewed Daniel Pearl, he said that like, like back in that day and with that budget and the kind of film they had, that wasn't that light sensitive. They had to use like, 30 whatever times the amount of lighting as a normal yeah yeah, yeah. it was if, if they yeah. shot I, d- I don't think they had negative stocks for I could be wrong for mm-hmm. 16 so they would have shot Kodachrome outdoors which is 64 speed mm-hmm. ISO 64 and oh, wow. Ektachrome I think is 160 mm-hmm. maybe they could push it a stop to 320 but it's not like nowadays we can go and dial in 25,000 ISO on a digital camera and shoot in your darkness, you know? So yeah, yeah, they, they, that's what they had to do. It's. And they had no monitor back then either to like see what they were really looking at. They just had that. Well, one well, the DP would know. I mean, right. DPs can look at a set and, and look to the eyepiece and know what it's going to look like. And Toby had mm-hmm. that ability. He could look to the eyepiece and know, but yeah, they weren't, you set the shot and you, depend on the camera operator to get it you, and you don't know till the next day yeah whether or not you got it yeah it must have been a real like uh anxious kind of wait thing but people yeah, knew what, yeah people knew what they were doing it, it you know it wasn't there were very few real surprises if you knew where you were doing then there would be no surprise right yeah i mean the, the you know the focus puller would know if they missed focus right do you have a general thought about the digital versus film like kind of moving on from film i still i still like film um Mm -hmm. i i just like the look of it and and the thing is if you shoot film and you cut negative that film's going to be around for a thousand years if you Mm -hmm. shoot digital and you're the problem with digital is there's no long-term archival solution 
it seems counterintuitive. Like you would think that the film would decay, but no. No, no, film doesn't. And if you do black and white separations of the color negative, you it'll last forever. Wow. Color will fade. Um, but you can restore that digitally, mm-hmm. you know. So no, I I prefer film. It's hard to it's hard to convince producers of that, but I'm hoping to shoot film for my next for my next one, actually. So good, yeah. Like I think I know like uh fly trap was digital. Yes, it, but it had to be. It had to be, yeah. Yeah. Uh the film, I think Pearl, when he described it to me, like the way it looks, like it kind of lends reality like a softer kind of glow, something, and that's what makes it appealing, I think, to me. Well, it's it, it's the same argument of, about people who prefer vinyl to CDs or to digital downloads. You know, digital, mm-hmm. everything is curves. Light, sound is is curves, right? They're waves. Yeah. And digital samples those waves. So no matter, even if you sample, a, a, you know, a song 44.1 thousand times a second, there are still gaps that are not being sampled. You're not getting the whole wave. Whereas mm-hmm. analog sound or film which is analog you get the whole wave it's oh, it, wow. it's it's more how the eye sees the world because our yeah. retinas don't sample <laughs> so i think that's it's just a more naturalistic look and digital especially with modern lenses can be artificially harsh yeah i see i think i know what you mean yeah artificially harsh yeah where like you would think that the digital look would preserve the way you, the eye sees it, but there's something about it that is like kind of. Well, it's all yeah. It's also the this ex- people have experimented with high frame rate, you know, 30, 60, 120 frames per second, um, as opposed to twenty four. But there's a reason twenty four frames per second works. And back in the day when sound was first going to be introduced. In the film business, they shot at 16 or 18 frames. Mm-hmm. And they did tests on an audience. They shot 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, I think all the way up to 30, 32 frames to yeah. see what felt right. And the audience stopped seeing a difference at about at 24. So that's oh, wow. how they settled on 24 frames. But I read, I don't know, 15 years ago, some neuroscientist did some research to try to figure out why that is. Why is it that 120 frames per second looks fake to us mm-hmm. and 24 looks real? And it's because the optic nerve sends signals to the brain at about 24 frames per second. <sighs> That's sort of how our eye perceives things. So 24 looks normal. You've actually read that before. That's really crazy. Yeah, it, yeah it's really crazy, but that's... So... Obviously, they didn't know that when they were like figuring out what worked back then. To 24 no, they just they just tested it on audiences to see what felt right, what they really liked. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm glad you you shared that because sometimes when like it takes like a left turn in the conversation, it's it's that's yeah. my favorite part. Yeah, well, I'm all about left turns. You should see me in a meeting <laughs> 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 when people start looking confused. I bring it back to the subject at hand. <laughs> <laughs> know what you mean cool Devin do you have anything else to say? Um, no I mean I think I'm good I mean you know as someone who watched the movie for the first time last night it was really cool to like you know sit down and hear from somebody who was actually involved in it so thanks a lot for, uh, for sitting down with us oh, absolutely thanks for being fans I love it well, have a good rest of the night you too Thanks a lot, Steve. Take care, guys. Thank you, man. Later. All right. All right. Bye. Later.